Hello and welcome to YHTV's news series, Empowerment Through Positive Psychology. And today what we're going to bring to you is a excerpt from one of our Magical Medical Tours episodes, number 82, with Marissa Pei, Psychology for the Corporation and Individual. It is, she's magnificent. I hope you enjoy this clip and uh, this is just a piece of what we will be bringing to you in 2014. How do people find their mission? Um, well, you have to get out of bed. That's the first thing. Excellent. So, so staying, staying in bed and you have to um, get in touch with the core of who you are. And that means getting past the busyness of what you're doing and the critical voices that are in your head, the monkey brain, as they call it, or I call it my, um, my committee in my head. I have a CEO that knows what everybody's supposed to be doing, a CFO that's always worried about money, and an auditor that's criticizing me no matter what I say and do. It's not good enough. You should have done this. You shouldn't have done that. You should have said this. You shouldn't have said that. So getting past that critic and going into the core of who you are. And that's why I teach Tai Chi Gong um, as well as, you know, I'm a big fan of yoga because it helps us get past that critical mind into the connection of our heart, which is connected to the source of life, which is where the joy is. So I, I, I lost my question there. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do that sometimes. I'm warning you. <laughs> but that's that's how we find who we are and what we're supposed to be doing. In fact, I have a friend. She doesn't have an answering machine. She has a question mach machine. And when you call her, it says, who are you and what do you want? And those two <laughs> questions are the most important questions to ask yourself over and over and over at every juncture so that you're clear as to who you are and what you're supposed to be doing. So a lot of us, myself included, get caught up, you know, we in this in this storybook life that we think is supposed to be our life. So many of us grew up on Cinderella, Snow White, the gospel according to uh, uh, fairy tales. And so I thought that if I, you know, went to school, got a degree, got a job or career, got married, had children, I would live happily ever after. Well, <laughs> look at me. <laughs> there is no happily ever after. That is a fantasy, okay? And it's really, it, 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 it really leads you down a path where you are scrambling constantly trying to be happy. You think that by, if I have, okay, if I have 10,000 in the bank, I'll be happy. If I have 100,000 in the bank, I'll be happy. If I have a million in the bank, I'll be happy. If I, you know, meet my soulmate, I'll be happy. If I have children, I'll be happy. And, or if I get that second house or the house on the beach or the second car. And, and what I've learned myself and working with many very successful people who have all of those things, that that does not bring happiness. That if we are constantly looking for happiness or an identity of who I am outside of ourselves, we are not going to be happy. Because then we're always looking for what I call relational definitions of who I am. People say, well, I'm a mother, I'm a consultant, I'm a uh, talk show host, I'm a teacher. And, and so you define yourself by what you do or your relationship with another person. And you know, I hate to tell you this, but shiitake happens and, and you're not going to be perfect at whatever you are a re in a relationship with or who you are or how you're defining yourself if you're defining yourself by what you do or who you are. So you're constantly on that hamster wheel trying to be the perfect mother or the perfect teacher or the perfect boss. And, 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 it, and again, that does not bring happiness because usually perfectionists, or I'm a recovering perfectionist or uh, also known as a control freak, um, you know, it's not a hundred percent anything. It, 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 shiitake happens. And if I get 99 compliments on how great of a mom I am, and I one time scream 
at the top of my lungs in frustration. I am now thinking about how horrible of a mom I am. And I'm constantly trying to make that up, you know, substitute uh, worker, uh, supervisor, whatever you want to um, uh, uh, substitute that with. So if I define myself in who I am as what I do or my relationship or my role, then I am not going to find out how to make myself happy or if I'm happy or, or who I am. If on the other hand, I go back to the source and I go back to who I am outside of the critical head and connect with taking a deep breath in, gently eyes closed and being quiet and find myself under that critic, under the role, under the relationship and define myself as the core of who I am. Then I can find what it is that makes me happy in what I'm doing and what I'm accomplishing in life. So for those of you who are listening and who are are not happy, and usually this happens around midlife. This is the the what I call the 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 big midlife crisis. There, there really is a midlife crisis because I think that you know that book that that belief system, the the Cinderella story, breaks down somewhere around midlife, and all the things that you thought would make you happy don't make you happy anymore, and the things that you, you really, um, want, you have no control over. So you want great health. You want a great family. You want a great partner. You want a great career. You want a great job. And you find yourself laid off, divorced. Um, uh, uh, your kids hate you, minor teenagers, uh, it, which just comes with the, with the territory. Um, you, all those things that you are, are uh, so your, your nest egg is gone because you, you either got laid off or, um, you know, the economy has shifted. So, so now if I live in the space of that fantasy or that Cinderella story, I am going to now say, okay, I guess the rest of my life is hopeless. I'm hopeless. So at this midlife juncture, it is critical to use the most powerful thing that we have in this lifetime, which is choice, to change the way that we view our lives, to change the way that we see what our life is supposed to be. So if I'm no longer happy or I want to be more happy and I want more joy in my life, I have a choice. I can see this thing called life differently than how I saw it before. So my expectation now is, you know what? It is not my entitlement to come into this lifetime to to be entitled to a normal, healthy, loving, unconditional, loving home. And it is not my entitlement to play by the uh, the Cinderella rules, which is if you work hard, then nothing bad happens to you and you make a lot of money and you get to retire and, and, and then live on the beach and drink pina coladas. That no longer is the construct to bring us happiness. Even, and, and, and trust me, even when people had a lot of money, it was still not the construct for happiness. I worked with people who had all of that, who made $5 million a year, and they were asking me, why am I not happy? Okay. Now I know there's some of you out there that are just like, well, I didn't get my chance at the 5 million. Give me 5 million. I promise you, I will be happy. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) We can do that too. We can do that too. But in the meantime, I want you to use the life balance tool of choice and decide that I can be happy without 5 million. I can be happy even if I get laid off. I can be happy even if I don't am not in a relationship with a soulmate. I can be happy even if there's shiitake raining down all over the place. I can be happy even if I am not in perfect health because that is the lemonade I am trying to get you to drink. I'm not trying to get you to drink Kool-Aid, <laughs> but I am trying to help 
that's my beneficial presence on the planet. I realize that because I'm so shy, sarcasm <laughs> is another service I offer, um, right. because I have gone through things like extreme physical abuse as a child. I have gone through a $480,000 divorce that I'm paying for. I have gone through um, a, a major hip replacement and three major surgeries a couple years ago. I have um, I had a, a lot of difficult growing up not white in a white place where I had a lot of discrimination going on. I have lived uh, a place where uh, I've been betrayed over and over and over again. And I can tell you that I would not trade any one of those experiences in my life because they made me who I am right now. And who I am right now, I'm very clear that I'm not perfect, but 88% of me is pretty darn good. <laughs> and I love my life. I, no matter what happens, I love my life because I choose to put on my life jacket with a silver lining. Perfect. In everything, there is a choice. I can either look at best case scenario or worst case scenario. I can, I can focus on how horrible my lemon is and how sour it is or I can choose to make lemonade in time. I'm not saying that you should, you know, walk around in denial and say, I'm fine. You know, like that Seinfeld uh, episode where, um, what's his name's dad walked around and went serenity now, serenity now, <laughs> serenity now. And at the end of the episode, he like smashed $2 million worth of computers from all the pent up stress. I'm not saying that we should not feel frustrated. Absolutely. I'm not saying we shouldn't feel sad. We should feel sad. When, when horrible things happen, it's part of our heart. We should cry. Tears are the disinfectant that make our heart soft. It's important to feel fully human all the time. But we have a choice on whether we want to stay pretty much above sea level or stay below sea level. And, and so the feelings below sea level are those that don't feel great. We don't have to stay there. We can feel frustrated and curse at the guy who just cut us off and let it go without put, using our fingers or just go take the breath in. Oh, I'm sure I've cut off someone before. God bless them. They obviously need it. And then <laughs> that's the vent. And then we focus on, wow, look at the beautiful silhouette of the palm trees while I'm sitting in traffic. <laughs> it's a choice. But I know that it makes me feel better when I'm not marinating in that negativity, in that angst, in that worry, because worry is not a paying job. Mm, that's so. a good point. You know, you mentioned, <laughs> she gets, she gets you mentioned the top so she many things award. there, Marissa. Uh, you, you mentioned <laughs> storybooks and, and kids and teenagers and everything else. I know that as an author, you wrote a very interesting book called mm. Mommy, What Are yes. Feelings? And yes. I remember in my life growing up, I, don't, I never asked that question, and I would mm. guess that most people never asked that question. How does mm. that book uh, fit into the essence of your mission? It's one of my proudest uh, creative endeavors, and uh, the book is called Mommy, What Are Feelings? And each feeling has a taste, touch, sight, and sound. And each feeling was actually illustrated by my daughters when they were three and five years old. And each page has a place where the child is encouraged to draw their own feelings. Um, it's over there. I don't know if I can grab it or not, but uh, I, I, I wasn't prepared to actually show you the book. But if you um, actually, if you come visit me this week at the Braveheart Women's Conference, I'll be in the ballroom actually doing a book and DVD signing. So you can see it then. But it's one of my proudest because it's used for uh, autistic children. In, across the nation to help yeah. them express their feelings. And so I'm very, very proud of that. Uh, what happens in this uh, thing called life when we grow up in school, in our traditional school system, uh, and, and they do the best that they can. And I am grateful. Uh, my kids are in a great school system. Um, I love the administrators and the teachers. They've had a great time uh, going through that system. Uh, but the, the way that our school systems work, we don't talk about feelings. 
uh, we, we have classes in math. We have classes in uh, social sciences. Uh, the closest we get is health. Uh, we expect our homes to talk about things like feelings and relationships and how to get along or the church. Um, well, there's a lot of people who've developed an allergy towards church uh, in this generation, um, largely because uh, a lot of us grew up with a God who needs anger management classes. So, so that area of um, uh, teaching is sort of gone by the wayside. Family systems, and uh, I love my family, and uh, a lot of us, you know, uh, I think Oprah says, I say like it's seven out of 10, I think, based on psychology today research, have grown up in dysfunctional homes. And uh, Oprah says it's as high as eight. And that system doesn't necessarily teach us well about feelings or relationships as well, because we are condemned to repeat our past and, and our parents do the best that they can. And uh, I will guarantee you, if you grew up in a family of abuse, if you look back the generation before, the generation before, it's just a pattern of that's repeating itself because there's no way to, to remedy that because we're not specifically taught. Whereas I'm grateful that our generation is the first generation really that uh, has been able to make it okay to go for help in therapy, uh, to make it that there's a lot of books in self-help that help. So th <laughs> this is the, uh, the, the Stephen Wright line that I love is, the only thing wrong with the gene pool is there's no lifeguard. <laughs> <laughs> so this generation, we are starting to recognize that we have to learn differently in order to stop the dysfunction in the home. So that's another, you know, you asked earlier what my, my job is in this lifetime. It's also to help with that. So my, my radio show, the work that I do writing, the work that I do uh, um, uh, on TV is all towards that. And there's so many of us now that are recognizing that the whole, you know, the whole burgeoning, your show, uh, the burgeoning of, of, um, yoga as well. We're all getting agape international spiritual center that that's where I get my positive roots watered, the Chopra center. There's so many places now and we're starting to really come together to recognize that this thing called, um, uh, learning how to have better relationships and not to have uh, dysfunction in the home. Or, or as I say, trying to learn how to put the fun back into dysfunction. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. all uh, the effort that we are, uh, you know, the book, the uh, Mommy, What Are Feelings? It's all to make it okay to be human and to to recognize that if we can uh, uh, embrace this thing called feelings to, to not marinate in the feelings that are, are hurting us are not act and, and, and getting in our way of happiness, but also embracing those feelings. Now, the good news is that, that there is a recognition that we're not happy and, and we're talking about those feelings of not happy. Unfortunately, I think the pendulum has gone way to the other side where all we're talking about is feelings. And we have this, this um, flawed premise that we're supposed to be happy all the time. So what do we do? We're American. We don't like to work at things too long. We want an instant answer. And that's why I think one out of four Americans is on prescription medication because they, they go to the doctor. The doctor says, oh, you're not happy. Here, take this. Um, and then if you watch the, the side effects, I, I, it just always amazes me why, how people are, are taking all these drugs when it is so blatant that the side effects are going to kill you. So, or make you <laughs> even worse place than you started. If I was feeling occasionally unhappy, now I'm going to have thoughts of suicide because I'm taking this drug. Um, anyways, that's another show. <laughs> so, but, uh, I, you know, the, the, the fact of recognizing our feelings. And as you said, Glenn, you grew up not uh, understanding or being able to fully express your feelings. It is important that children understand that feelings are important, but balance that out with, it's not all about feelings. Feelings are just a guidance system to get us back on track. So when I'm feeling really angry. 
It's a signal that there's something that I have to adjust to get back to that natural good feeling center that I have. Statistics show that children on average laugh 400 times a day. Adults, on the other hand, laugh 40 times a day. So there's something off kilter there. What we want to capture at, at, in, as, as a child is have the child teach us how to be really cognizant of our feelings and get to that natural, good feeling place that we are. Uh, for those of you who are um, uh, studiers of the Vortex or Abraham and Esther and Jerry Hicks' work, uh, you can hear some of the words that I'm using, law of attraction. It is it is wonderful that medical science is now validating all those things in those teachings where it is good for us to be in a positive, happy place. It is not good for us health-wise to stay in there. Uh, Deepak Chopra cites, I believe, the Harvard, Harvard Medical School study that says there are three, two emotions that will hurt our body, mind, spirit, and soul health-wise. Anger and hostility. There are three emotions that give us uh, and our cells and our body, those 50 trillion cells, a wonderful way of working together. And that's peace, love, which are kind of, you know, expected. And then the, the surprising one for me was creativity which is why in my shows, I'm constantly, you know, what it is, what is, how does it creativity express in you? So feelings are important. Good feelings are super important. So in this thing called life, am I aware of what I am feeling? And that book, Mommy, What Are Feelings? You can use it as an adult to find out where you're feeling, get uh, uh, um, cognizant about where I'm feeling and then move to a better feeling place because that's, that is what we're supposed to do in this life. We're not supposed to marinate in anger, resentment, hopelessness, fear, uh, worry, doubt. We're not supposed to be there. We can feel it. And as soon as we feel it, that's a signal that we are not in our center. We're not in our balance. As, as Esther says, we're not in our vortex. And that's just a clear signal. How do I get back there? Do I need to forgive someone? Do I need to let something go? Do I need to um, uh, give a compliment instead of a criticism? Do I need to uh, keep my word to myself that I said I was going to get up and go for a walk? Uh, I'm feeling bad because I'm not going for a walk. Well, let's go for a walk. Let's just go. Uh, let's just, as uh, one of my teachers, Edwin Gaines says, let's exercise the gospel according to Nike and just do it. <laughs> well, I hope you enjoyed that moment with uh, Marissa Pay. And that was only an excerpt from uh, the one hour show on Magical Medical Tour, episode 82, Psychology for the Corporation and Individual. It was, it's a pretty magnificent um, episode, so please do uh, enjoy. Um, and again, if you have any comments um, or questions that you would like to uh, share with uh, Marissa Pay or Dr. Glenn Woolman, please type it into the comment box down there on your screen. Or if you prefer, you can call us at 818-LET'S-TALK, 818-LET'S-TALK. Um, and leave your name and your question or comment and your contact number, the best way for us to contact you back so that we, so you know that we got your comment or suggestion or question and we can actually reply to you. So if you enjoyed that, I look forward to sharing with you more on our Empowerment Through Positive Psychology series. Be sure to check out also our new slate of shows for 2014. This is not the only one that is new. There is quite a few more coming. And uh, we look forward to having you play with us in our virtual sandbox. Until next time, I'm Christina Suzuma. Namaste. YHTV's Magical Medical Tour. Come join Dr. Glenn Woolman and Christina Suzuma as they journey through the healthcare galaxy interviewing doctors, healthcare practitioners in the attempt to share ways to achieve optimal health. 
Join us on yogahub.tv every Tuesday at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. Breathing is a very important part of everything we do. And in the Wallman metaphor, square breath, if you can imagine or see the picture of a square, in the bottom left-hand corner is uh, an A, and then up in the left-hand corner is B, then over is C, and then at the bottom right is D. This is the metaphor, square breath. If you think about it, when a person uh, is born, the first thing that they do in life uh, that declares that they're an individual is to take a, a deep breath, and that's inspiration, and we make that inspirational. 